enzymes are awesome. Basically, your cells are filled with all of these molecules just like floating around in there randomly. And they're supposed to interact in these various ways if you want to actually like make molecules out of that whole jumble of chemicals. But in order to do that, they kind of need some help. And this is where enzymes come in. So enzymes are catalysts. What this means is they speed up a reaction without getting used up themselves in the process. So they can do this over and 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 over. And they don't get exhausted. They're like the energy bunny, like on steroids. It's crazy. Um, what makes these, but so these molecules are often proteins. Um, sometimes they're like a complex of a protein and RNA. Sometimes they're just RNA. I remember I was so fascinated to learn that like the ribosome, so the enzyme that pieces together protein letters, so amino acids to form proteins. So the ribosome is actually like mostly RNA. It's crazy. Um, RNA is pretty awesome and proteins are pretty awesome. And I work with both. So I am not taking sides. I think they're both really cool. And when they work together, it's even cooler. So what are these enzymes doing? What they're doing is they're basically making it easier for a reaction to occur. And there's a variety of different ways that they can do this. Um, but so in addition to, so we have these molecules like floating around in the cell, remember, and there's all sorts of these molecules. So when we talk about reactions, like in a textbook or whatever, we're talking about like this plus this equals this. And so we're just considering everything in like isolation, how you have just like this amino acid, so this protein letter and this protein letter, and then you join them together and you get a poly, like you get a peptide chain or whatever. But in the reality, like in your cell, everything is just like, there's just so much stuff in there. So it's just fascinating to think that these reactions can actually like occur so specifically um, and occur at all. Um, and the main reason for that is these enzymes. So what these enzymes do, like one of the main things, the easiest thing to think about in how they can like catalyze or speed up a reaction is just like simply bringing those things together um, and kind of like holding them there in place to react. And that brings, and that's not all they do, but that brings up an, uh, an important concept is that enzymes aren't like forcing a reaction to occur. It's kind of like the whole bring a horse, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make a drink thing. So enzymes can like bring of these molecules together in the right orientation and the optimal conditions and all of these things, but the molecules like don't want to react, they're not gonna. So they don't change like the intrinsic properties of how the molecules like want or don't want to interact. Um, and so when we talk about like this do or don't want to interact, what I'm talking about is like the free energy change. Um, so it, which we call, usually refer to as like a delta G. So where G stands for the gives free energy. So if we think of a reaction, we can have, um, I like to think of like reactions as kind of like rainbows. Um, and so we have the starting point, where we have the energy of the reactants and then the end point, which is like our pot of gold, which is the energy of the products. And the reason why it's like this rainbow shape is that you have to overcome this hurdle, like this barrier to this activation energy barrier in order to get to the pot of gold at the other side. Um, so if you imagine like trying to snap a stick, when you're bending, bending, bending the stick, there's going to be that really uncomfy point at the top. And that's like the transition state. Um, and you have to get it to that really uncomfy point. And I like to think of free energy kind of like uncomfiness. So the more uncomfy a molecule is, the um, higher the free energy. And free energy is kind of like bad um, in the terms that molecules don't really like it's kind of weird to, like I know I anthropomorphize a lot um but it's just kind of how that's my brain's point of reference um so that's how things kind of make sense for me so sorry if you don't like anthropomorphizing things um but then you're probably not gonna like a lot of my stuff but anyway so if a molecule is like uncomfy it's gonna want to get comfy and the way it's gonna get comfy is by doing things like breaking or releasing part of it's like releasing part of itself or um, adopting a different conformation. So like a different shape that brings it back to this more comfy 
stage. So you can see that in this, well, this is what we call like a state function, um, this delta G. So when we go from the energy of the reactants to the energy of the products, we're not, we have this same change in free energy, no matter what pathway we take between them. So if we have an uncatalyzed reaction, so in the absence of like an enzyme, we're going to have a high activation barrier, but, and we have the same delta G as if we had an enzyme catalyzed reaction where we have a lower activation barrier. Um, so we have to put in less energy, um, but we have the same delta G because when you put in all that energy, you get that same energy back, but you have to put it in first. So you have to invest more money in the process, even though you get that money back. Um, so it's harder for the reaction to occur in the absence of an enzyme. But what's really important to know is that the end result, so the end, like at equilibrium. So basically equilibrium is when you have the same amount of a reaction like going forward and backwards. So it doesn't mean that you have the same amount of products and reactants. That's not what it means. Instead, it means that you have the same amount of the forward and backwards reactions. So if you have a, take a reaction and you let it go to equilibrium, well, in the absence of an enzyme, that's probably gonna take a really, 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 really long time. But imagine that you do get it to that point, you will have the same proportion of products to reactants as you would if you had an enzyme catalyzed one. So you're not changing the endpoint like amounts of these various things. You're just making it get there a lot faster. Um, and the way, so you're not changing, that's in what proportion you have of like reactants or products or whatever, that's a function of this like delta G. It's not tipping the scales at the top either. So if you have a big difference in delta G between the reactants and the products, you're going to um, this you're going to favor the formation of the products because it's harder to get all the way back up this hump. If you have a um, reaction where these are closer together, you're more likely to have it go either way, which is why these reactions um, can be go forward and backwards um, more often, and you have like a more equal amount of reactants and products um, unless you're actually like doing something to actively remove the products because of that whole Le Chatelier thing. So when you have this enzyme catalyzed reaction, it's important to know that it's bi-directional. It's not tipping the scale one way or another. So when you get to the top of the rainbow, you can go either direction and the enzyme isn't going to change which direction you're going to go. So an enzyme isn't going to change which direction is like of a reaction, like whether the forward or backward reaction is favored or anything like that, is this going to make it easier to get to that tipping point? Then, but so sometimes your cells can have reactions where they're basically, um, sorry, where they're basically like unidirectional, but that's because your cells are like doing either there's such a big difference between like the products and the reactants that it's harder to go back up that barrier to the other side. Um, um, so if we go back to, sorry. So we, if we think of the potential energy, so this is where that delta G comes from. So you have like the, pro, the potential energy of the reactants and the potential energy of the products. Um, and so then the delta G is the difference between them. If you have um, an enzyme catalyzed reaction, you often have to, you provide this activation energy to push it up to this transition state. And then this is given back. And um, so this is kind of what I talked about before. I just didn't have the right slide up to talk about it. So sorry. Um, but basically the enzymes are lowering the activation energy that you need to put in. Um, but they're doing it in both directions. Um, so when you get to this top point, the reaction can still go either way. However, because your delta G of your products is down here, if it's harder to get up back up, 
this transit to this transition point from here to here than it is from here to here. And so this would favor the forward direction. Um, but a lot of times the reactions, you don't have this big gap between them. So it's a lot easier. It's you can go either direction um, more flexibly. And especially in biochemistry, what happens is we can actually have another reaction add, add activation energy, such as coupling a reaction to a reaction that uses ATP. So we talked about ATP the other week. Um, and it's like your cell's energy currency. So it's like these negatively charged phosphate groups. I don't think I have a picture of it in, up here. We have these negatively charged phosphate groups. It's kind of like a clamp together spring. Um, and so it's holding a lot of energy in it. Um, and remember how we talked about how like high energy is kind of uncomfy. So in order to make themselves comfier, they can get rid of one of those phosphate groups and they can give that energy that they release to help react, make a reaction go. So providing the activation energy needed to get over the barrier. So that doesn't have, that's not like directly connected to enzymes that can happen like with or without enzymes, but like, well, enzymes actually help couple the processes too. But the whole idea of having this activation energy that can, ATP can kind of like help get to that activation energy. Um, and that's why you can get like reactions to go in like unfavored directions. Um, but the basic principle is that that's so that's one way that you can try to like get a reaction to occur that wouldn't normally occur. And then the enzymes help lower the amount of activation energy that you actually need the ATP or whatever to provide for the reaction to occur. So both of those are ways that you can help a reaction get to occur. In terms of like another reason why you might see a reaction go in one direction as opposed to another is that when you have this reaction, so although you have like, it can go either way at the top or whatever, but then when it gets to the bottom, like if you take away the product, there's this thing called the Chatelier's principle. You might've learned in like general chemistry, how reaction, like if you take away one thing, then the reaction is going to be driven to like make more of that thing because it's trying to get to that equilibrium that we talked about before, where it's like that ideal like endpoint that it wants to get to. So if you're keeping like taking away the thing that it's trying to make, it's gonna make more. Um, and so, I mean, at the chemical level or whatever, it's not like it's trying to make more to get to that point. It's just that you're taking away the product. And so there's less product to go that way than there is reactants to go that way. Um, and so that's another way that your cells can kind of tip the scales in order um, to make more of the process or whatever. Um, so I'm getting kind of away from the enzyme concept, but it just kind of helps you understand why how your body can have like different amounts of these different products and different amounts than you might expect based on the equilibrium. But the whole idea with the enzyme is that it's making it easier to reach whatever equilibrium. Um, so it's catalyzing this direction in either direction. It's just making it easier to get to that point. Um, and so how enzymes do this is often that they, that they um, stabilize that, intermediate state that like transition state so that really uncomfy point so in some like books and stuff you might hear this idea of like a lock and key mechanism how an enzyme's kind of like shaped perfectly for the substrate and then the substrate comes in and then the reaction happens but that's not really right it's more of an induced fit if you had a key and if you had like this lock and key mechanism sure it's going to bind really well but then it has like no motivation for changing, right? Um, so you've just bound it, but it's like, if you, it's like if you were to bind your stick in like this, your stick has no motivation to break. But if you bind the stick kind of like in a bent position and stabilize that bent position, well, now your stick's gonna want to get to that bent position because that's where it has like the maximum interactions with this active site and it gets the most it's the most comfy and it or not most comfy but it's more comfy and it's like uncomfy state because that uncomfiness is being compensated by all of this love it's getting from the enzymes active site so you get this idea of this like induced fit um and then once it's in this like transition state so that's the tipping point and so now it can go either way in the absence of the enzyme the 
the stick would like have to just like decide to get to that uncomfy state on its own, um, which isn't very likely. But with this induced fit thing, the enzyme can help go like this. So at this point, your your stick can still like fall out and break and stay stable, or it can go all the way and break, right? So that's kind of like the idea of this enzyme can catalyze the reaction in the forward and reverse directions. Equally, it's just going to make it faster to get to the end point. Um, so the transition state is often what's stabilized. Um, and then the enzyme, because it's like a catalyst, it can do this over and over without getting used up. So sometimes enzymes have like helper molecules. So cofactors, so sometimes these are like metals, sometimes these are organic things. Um, so organic just means basically it's like based on like a carbohydrate, a carbo, um, sorry, a hydrocarbon structure. So it's like carbon hydrogen based. Um, so some, a lot of times these are like vitamins. So like vitamin C, vitamin B, um, various cofactors um, that can act. Um, and so we call those coenzymes if they like come and go. And if they're like permanently stuck in an enzyme, we call those a prosthetic group. Um, but these are all different terms. And another term you might hear is like an apoenzyme, which is an enzyme by itself. And then a co if you add a cofactor, now it's the holoenzyme. So it's the enzyme with um, the cofactor. And so not all enzymes need cofactors, but some do. Um, sometimes these cofactors can actually kind of like get used in the reaction and they have to be like regenerated. Um, so maybe they'll get like reduced or um, that sort of thing. And then they have to be regenerated. Um, but so it's after that regeneration step, then the enzyme is like ready to go again. Um, and so, but the enzyme itself can get used over and over and that's what like makes them so amazing. Um, another thing that makes them so amazing. So basically, you might, there's like things like inorganic catalysts or whatever. So in industry um, and pharmaceutical production and a bunch of different things, there's like in vitro synthesis. Um, like, well, we talk about in vitro a lot in biochemistry and stuff. We're talking about just like outside of cells usually. Um, sometimes you talk about in vitro when it's like inside of cells, but it's like, it's, it's this awkward like middle area um, where I just say in cells if people are doing stuff in cells because it's not like in vivo, which is like in the organism or in the animal, unless you're talking about like bacteria or yeast or like other single cell stuff. Um, but typically, like when I'm doing in vitro stuff, it's just like molecules in a test tube. Um, but so when people are doing like synthesis, they're typically using like really harsh conditions. Um, to try to really maximize like the rate, rate of reactions and that sort of thing. Under those conditions, like enzymes would be dead. Um, so enzymes are really sensitive and that sort of thing. Um, but they're really, really great because they're so specific and they, um, they're, the, the, they provide, the way they're so like specific and they can even get the right stereochemistry. So like left versus right-handed orientation type of things. The reason why they can do that is because they have all this context from the actual protein. Um, so from having this big protein shape um, or, or RNA shape. Um, so basically, just a quick reminder. So proteins are long strings of amino acids. So these protein letters that are linked together. To form these polypeptide chains. And then, so these amino acids, they have this generic backbone and then they have these unique side chains that stick out. And these side chains have these different properties. And so each of these different properties is kind of like, it's influencing how the protein is going to fold up into its form, into its final state. And they're also providing these different like groups that can potentially interact and help a reaction occur. So when a protein folds up based on the sequence of this amino acids, um, it can have like pockets and like things like that. And so with the substrate, so that the substrate is like the thing that's going to bind to an enzyme and get changed. So when a substrate binds, it's going to bind to like a binding site, or like the active site is where the actual reaction is going to be catalyzed. So often in the active site, you actually have like the side chains from various amino acids sticking out. Um, and so some of them that are like especially important are like the charged groups, um, as well as groups with like hydroxyl groups, 
So um, like serine, methionine and stuff like they have this OH group that can um, help interact, but it's often like these um, also like histamine and stuff that can coordinate metals. Um, so there's various amino acids that can serve these like crucial roles in this active site. But the active site itself is being formed because because of like this whole like chain of protein. So everything's kind of contributing to make it what it is. Um, and so let me get to a different slide. Okay, when I, so when I talked about kinases, so kinases are one type of um, enzyme that add these phosphate groups onto an enzyme. And so, so you can see here is like one of the strategies they can use is that this, um, they're doing this, that's holding the ATP in place and the protein substrate in place for the optimal reactions, shielding the charges from one another and then using the negative um, the metal cations and negatively charged amino acids chain. So this this um is using a basic residue to pull off this protein from the sub proton from the substrate, and that causes it to attack. Um, so you basically you have these this um catalytic residue in this active site that is helping provide make this reaction go, and then it's holding on to these metal cofactors like I talked about before. But all of this is because you have like this whole protein making this binding pocket. And so here in this article, you can see all of these different amino acids. So these things in like these colors that are like actually interacting um, with, so here it's like an inhibitor that's bound to the active site. Um, but basically, the idea is that the protein itself is getting its structure from this whole chain and then that within that structure, you have like a specific like active site where the reaction is actually happening. And the reaction site itself is happening mainly based on like those individual amino, special amino acids that are sticking out. But you have this entire context where specific parts of the molecule, say, are binding to one part of the substrate and helping position it in the active site. So it's really a team effort. Um, and this is what makes it so important, like so specific and so um, orientation specific and all of this stuff, um, which is actually how I got into today's post because I was working on a post about the Nobel Prize in chemistry, which is for these like um, small molecule catalysts that can catalyze like reactions in like this very specific way. So like right hand versus left hand. Um, but then, so I was writing about how this is how enzymes are so good at this. And I was like, well, I need to talk about enzymes themselves more because they're just so awesome. Um, so that's how I got into this. But so some of the ways that, and I'm just kind of rambling, but there was more stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, so some of the ways that enzymes are able to do their magic um, is that they, um, they can solve a lot of different problems that will make it less likely that a reaction will occur. Um, so one of these is entropy. And so basically that's just the idea that you have molecules just like floating all around and all around. Um, and this is like lowering the probability that they'll collide productively. So in order to actually interact, these molecules actually have to come together. Um, so the enzyme can kind of like bring them together and like clamp them down in the right orientation. So by Clamping down, basically, you remember that like active side or even not the active side, just another part of the molecule. You have a lot of different residues. So in addition to those catalytic residues, which are actually like helping make the reaction happen directly, you have a lot of other um, residues. So residues, sorry, that's just like the amino acids to the protein letters once they link together because they, um, because they've lost this like amino part and the hydroxyl part because they're connecting through that part. Now these individual, what used to be individual amino acids, we now call these residues because um, they're like the residue. So what's left over from the amino acids because now they're not amino acids because you've lost them in the amino and acid groups. So, um, so that's just what we mean by residue. Um, um, so you often have like, even those like boring residues, just like the normal like polar ones that, aren't directly interacting or whatever, they can be forming bonds. Um, so these kinds of bonds are like usually non-covalent bonds. Um, and so they are just kind of 
we call them bonds, but they're more just like partial charge attractions. But you have these attractions that are kind of like sticking the molecules together in this non-permanent way, um, but kind of just giving them an incentive to stay stuck if they um, if they if they collide. Um, so, and it's crucially, it's doing this in like the right orientation. So like, remember when we talked about the whole idea of like induced fit? So it's making it comfiest in, or at least less uncomfy in a position that it would normally be uncomfy. So it's kind of like subtly getting it to um, adopt the confirmation of the shape that's most convenient for the reaction to occur a specific way. So it promotes, um, this is one of the reasons why you can get like that stereoselectivity. So that whole like left versus right-handed thing is because you're holding the molecule in a way that um, promotes the reaction to occur in a single direction. Plus your like filling parts are also like, also, like already um, stereo-specific. But anyway, that's for the other post. Um, what else? So the solvation shell. So basically when you have a molecule in like a solution, so the molecule is like floating around, it's coated in this whole like solution solvent shell. So basically it's surrounded by a lot of water molecules. Um, so these water molecules um, allow this like substrates or whatever. So if you have like a molecule of ATP um, floating around, it's going to have this like water all around it. And so that's great for keeping that ATP dissolved, but it's also like hiding the ATP from other things that might go and steal it or whatever. So when this ATP binds, the solvent, the solvation shell, so basically the water around the ATP, it, it gets kind of like replaced by bonds to the protein, um, kind of like freeing it up. And you also get like this, um, when you have the, the water released, you're kind of like getting this entropy gain um, because you take all these ordered water molecules and now you make them disordered. Um, and so that increases entropy, which is actually like nature likes that. It's like one of the laws of thermodynamics that increase in entropy is good or whatever. Like molecules like to be free. Um, and so when you make them freer, then they're happier. Okay. Um, so then we have the whole stabilization thing. Um, you also, a lot of times reactions have like unstably charged intermediates. So a lot of times, for example, you have a group getting like attacked and then it has like too many bonds and then it's like weirdly charged and all of this stuff. And so enzymes are able to like loan protein, protons or electrons. So like negative or positively charged subatomic pieces. Um, and they often do this with the help of metals. So they often act as like chelators. Um, so a chelator is something that binds down. Um, it's like a metal biter or whatever. And so it is holding down on this uh, metal ion. So an ion is just a charged particle. And this is allowing it to kind of stabilize like awkward intermediate states um, and charge products. Um, and so, yeah, so that's why metals are often cofactors. Sometimes with enzymes, you get something called covalent catalysis, um, where the substrate is actually making like stable, like covalent bonds with the, um, with the, um, with the enzyme or with like the cofactor or whatever, but because it's like, it's just an intermediate. Um, and so it gets regenerated, which is why it's still like an enzyme, but you can have in some cases like covalent catalysis and that's sometimes happening through lysines um, through something called like a shift phase. Um, sometimes happens with um, cysteines um, and like disulfide linkers. Um, so, too complicated stuff to get into here, but those are just some of the um, concepts that are important for just kind of thinking about enzymes in general. Um, so note that I'm not going here into like all this Michaelis Menten stuff. Um, I have posts on that if you're interested, but I don't want to go into all of that. But that's just like a basic way you can, um, it's talking about enzyme kinetics, so how fast, um, reactions occur um, 
And so Maud Benton um, co-developed this Michaelis Menten equation, and I show you how to um, work with all of that and stuff. But I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, so yeah, so but kinetics deals with how fast a reaction occurs, whereas like thermodynamics is going to tell you about like that endpoint. So that's based on like a delta G and that stuff. Um, and yeah, so basically different enzymes can speed up reactions like faster or slower or whatever. Um, but remember the enzyme isn't changing the endpoint, so it's not changing like the thermodynamic stuff. It's not because you have that whole state function where the beginning and the end point are what matters. Um, and the it's just making it like a shorter rainbow and not actually changing the um, energy of the reactants or the products. <laughs>